And so now it is my um, pleasure to introduce Mark Heller. Mark Heller is a consultant with more than 25 years of national and senior leadership experience in the healthcare and service industries in both private and public sectors. He has demonstrated a visionary leadership style, a passion for excellence, and a shrewd understanding of the critical controls and performance metrics and the complete operational continuum. He has overseen environmental services programs in over 350 institutions throughout Canada, and he has led some of the healthcare industry's um, largest transformative changes, as well as pioneered the delivery of top caliber programs, creating industry-leading benchmark standards, policies, and symptoms. Mr. Heller is presently completing his master's degree in business administration through Queen's University. He will be speaking to us today on environmental infection prevention control. What does good look like? Please join me in welcoming Mark Heller. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to join you here today in Saskatoon. Um, I can't help but think before I start, um, as a environmental services uh, representative, um, what a journey uh, Chica and environmental services have had over uh, a few years. And I'll take a, a moment to indulge a little story. I think my first Chica conference was in London somewhere 2005, 2006 area. And I went to London uh, as a representative of the environmental services industry. And I entered the ballroom at the convention center in London, and I think somebody said there were five or 600 or 900 infection control practitioners in the room, and then there was me. <laughs> the only non-environmental or non-infection control person uh, in the room. And I sat there for the morning listening to the speakers and I thought, why am I here? And then at break, people came up to me and said, ooh, where are you in ICP? And when I explained what I did, they said, why are you here? <laughs> What's environmental cleaning got to do with infection prevention and control? I had that statement said to me. And here we are, a few years later, all of us recognizing that environmental cleaning is an important component to an overall infection control program. And so what I'm here today, uh, following some very uh, learned speakers who are presenting to you science, I'm here to talk a little bit about the human dimension of how you execute and what that means in the environmental services world we're going to make this a little interactive today, and so uh, you've all been given clickers. And uh, I, uh, I have the dubious honor in, in speaking uh, training 101, they tell you when you have to talk, think, and do at the same time, you're destined to failure. And it's exactly what I'm about to do with you, is fail, I guess, because I have to think, talk, and do at the same time. So bear with me if we don't handle this too graciously. But, um, I guess from my background, uh, as you heard, uh, I've had a bit of time in the area of environmental services and environmental cleaning. And at the last count, uh, I think I've worked with about 350 acute care hospitals in this country overseeing their cleaning programs. So many of you I know firsthand from doing work in your region, uh, but I've had that pleasure. So I bring to you an understanding of environmental cleaning and environmental services um, from every region of the country. And so that is really what I, I hope to share with you today. Um, and just as way of disclosure, um, I am a, uh, an independent consultant these days. I do consult in the private and public sector. Some of the organizations that are represented at Chica this year um, are clients of mine. So that I have to tell you. But the important thing today is we're all coming out of the closet. Now that's the cleaning closet, I hope you realize. Okay? Because as we all know, this uh, whole healthcare thing really is all about cleaning, right? Infection control, Florence Nightingale knew this way back. Everybody's mother has always known this, right? Gotta clean, cleaning matters. And what we're finding today is of course the growing body of scientific evidence that supports the role of the environment and the cleanliness of the environment as it relates to the transmission of microorganisms. And so, uh, first audience participation question. 
Everybody got their clicker. Okay, so what is your favorite type of wine? Now, click away, folks. You need to click a choice. So A, red, B, white, C, blush, D, it depends on whether you've had breakfast. All right. So another 10 seconds. Everybody clicked? Apparently I hit and, and then I hit a graph. Just, I just learned this about 10 minutes ago, folks, so bear with me. Okay, well, a whole bunch of you have a breakfast issue to think about. <laughs> So we'll have to have a little talk. Uh, there's got to be someone with business cards in the room that they can hand out to help with that regard. Uh, I'm a little worried about what they're serving on the buffet now. So anyway, that's just to get us used to this. Um, but on a serious note, uh, here's a question for you. In my facility, Environmental Services publishes a dashboard of performance metrics on a regular basis. And you got to let me click first. All right, go ahead. Nope, it's already hooked up to the send, apparently, so you just hit yes or no. A or B. I was going to give you a C, I don't know, but then we'll just stick with an A or B. All right, everybody in? All right, and uh, 66 of you said no. Okay, the overwhelming majority of you said no. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Because, of course, the case for environmental scorecards okay, is all about aligning every area of the organization to the overall strategy of the organization. It's also about public confidence. Increasingly today, uh, when we think about patient safety, employee safety, um, there is a true expectation of performance. And we all know in this room that the cleanliness of the environment and the performance of environmental services directly connects to the, to the safety of our patients and the safety of healthcare workers. But the other reality today, ladies and gentlemen, is of course the, the ugly question of money. And that we know that uh, envir or environmental services has to be accountable to the organization and has to do an increasingly better job of communicating their value in a way, in a proposition that the financial and administrative types in the organization can understand and interpret. So publishing a scorecard that speaks to not just the clinical outcomes and quality outcomes, but the overall financial component is, is also important. When we think about the value proposition about a healthcare organization, um, I want to take a little bit of time making sure that we understand that environmental services really speaks to the big three. And the big three are all about um, patient and resident wellness, access to care, and the control and optimization of cost. And the good news for those of us who are in the cleaning business or in the environmental services business is that environmental services can make a great case to connect to patient wellness through the reduction of hospital acquired infections as a supporting member of the infection control community and program. Access to care, all of us have busy emergency departments, busy patient throughput issues. And we all know firsthand in an acute care environment particularly that the turnover of those spaces is something that many institutions across the country are challenged in. And the third is that whole cost control and value equation. On a unit cost per basis, um, and I'm learning to speak that way through my <laughs> MBA studies at the moment, I'm learning the financial language of, of the day, on a unit cost per basis, Environmental services represents good value. If you think about all of the measures a healthcare facility could take, clinical measures, interventions, new um, administration of patients, um, other things that an organization could do, enhancing the cleaning component of an organization is one of the relatively more cost-effective strategies an organization could take. 
but it's increasingly important that environmental services be able to show a return on that investment. So, question now. In my facility, environmental services publishes a dashboard of performance metrics on a regular basis. Did we do this one? Oh, where's Vicky? We loaded one wrong. Ah, okay. All right, well, we'll leave that alone. We had a no on that one. Sorry about that. The thing that we need to understand, folks, is that within every healthcare institution, there is a political dynamic at play. And we all know that there are forces that control the finger pointing, uh, the accountability framework, use whatever language you'd like, but there is very much a, a movement of uh, where the patient turns to for support, uh, whether it's the clinicians or the public, where the politicians fit in, where environmental services in play, and you notice the little chica mouse over there. Okay? I really believe that this is a small but mighty force. Increasingly, when I talk to healthcare leaders across the country, I have to tell you that there is a new, if you don't know it already, there is an absolute new and profound respect for the work that infection control contributes to the healthcare organizations. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, this was a bunch of clinical folks that were uh, on the periphery of decision making, but I'm hearing over and over from CEOs and senior executives in healthcare how central they value the input from infection control today. So you really have the ability to be powerful catalysts in your organization. You may not think that, feel that way some days, but it actually is true. Okay. And of course, the other reason we care so much about accountability framework today is that the temperature is rising today when it comes to the interest of the media and the interest of the public when it comes to hospital-acquired infections. And we all have our wounds and horror stories of where the media has become involved in your institution or your region. Um, whether we're in British Columbia, whether we're in Ontario, we've been, I've seen it across the country where different organizations have faced a high degree of media scrutiny related to outbreaks, related to perceptions of environmental cleanliness. Um, and as it says, that doesn't mean they're always going to get it right. And we all know in the industry that there are many examples across the country where the media has misinterpreted, simplified messages, cut the science, ignored fact and real data to make a salacious story that's appealing to their readers or to their viewers. And uh, it's our job to try to make sense of that. One of the ways that we can counter that is through the use of a comprehensive dashboard of performance metrics. And the other reality today, healthcare is full of measurements. We love to measure things in healthcare. We'll measure anything. Um, but it's meaningful measurement and measurement back to the core objectives of the organization. And as I talked about a few moments ago, access to care, patient wellness, and cost control are powerful forces. As one CEO described it to me recently, there are three things I'm going to get fired over access to care, patient wellness, and cost control. And everything else is just noise. And so the challenge and the takeaway that I have from that comment was that all of us, whether it's in infection control or environmental cleaning, have a challenge to translate the work we do back to the big three. So, um, you know, the old adage says, you can't manage what you don't measure. And, you know, within environmental services, we need to, certainly need to have patient-focused indicators. From a quality point of view, um, environmental audit scores, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about environmental monitoring from my perspective. Um, patient satisfaction findings, I think the challenge there is to make an objective process that has some statistical relevancy to it. Uh, in other words, try to remove the subjectivity and, and use good st statistical uh, science behind your sampling size and process. Um, from an efficiency point of view, there is a requirement uh, to measure the productivity 
of environmental services, how it translates into the hours spent from a clinical point of view. When we think about environmental services today, uh, increasingly we need to be thinking about it in two ways, clinical and non-clinical environments. Um, and the best analogy I can think of you, for those of you who work in a, an institution and you think about the food services that are provided in your facilities, there are clearly three realms of food service delivery in most institutions. Clinical nutrition, patient or resident food service, and retail and cafeteria type services. And if you think about that, there is a common thread that goes through all of those pieces, food. Now translate that to environmental cleaning. And increasingly, we need to be viewing our environmental cleaning programs under two d distinct dimensions. The work that we do in a clinical environment throughout the facility and the work that we do in administrative public environments. Yes, there's an element of dirt removal to both. However, the objectives of, of the two areas are slightly different and uh, need to be resourced, trained, and have different areas of focus. And from a value point of view, tying the resources that are expended in environmental services directly to um, an attempt to quantify the clinical activity. So per patient day would be an example of trying to do that. Um, I don't know a healthcare institution in the country that is static when it comes to I have 300 beds and my occupancy is set. Um, patient day activities are all over the board in most institutions, many of them superseding their occupancy at other times with great highs and great lows in your numbers. And I can see a lot of nodding heads to that because that's your world on a daily basis. And it's important that the clinical uh, resources of environmental services also align to that ever-changing volume. Some things to watch for uh, when we thought, think, about, think about this area. <clears throat> Excessive qualifiers on performance dashboards. When we think about how data is presented today, if it comes with 25 footnotes underneath, trying to explain, rationalize, justify, then I would suggest there's some fundamental flaw in the methodology. So if you get a report of a performance dashboard that is explained away by many, many rationales and justifications and exceptions, then I think you have a serious er opportunity to doubt the validity of the, the survey process or the, the, the inputs themselves. Um, Excessive lag time, so looking at uh, environmental performance issues that are three, six, one year old is again uh, one of the risk areas. And data presentation without correlation to clinical performance. And so what I'm suggesting today that increasingly environmental services has to try and draw a line between the resources and the performance that they achieve and some sort of clinical outcome measure. Now, depending on your facilities, depending on your units, your wards, the type of care provided in your institution, that will look different. And I don't believe that there is one type of clinical outcome that is suitable for all. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly where you fit into the picture, helping to support your environmental services to draw appropriate conclusions and correlations to the clinical activity in your institution. Some areas of deep concern that we need to watch for, these are more internally focused uh, controls would be around the area of um, staff satisfaction surveys um, about environmental services, pass-fail type indicators, um, absenteeism rates, um, cost information that are static, things like uh, cost per square foot or square meter, or uh, cost per bed type indicators. These are static based indicators that don't really reflect the dynamic of, of an ever changing uh, healthcare facility. So I present these as sometimes valuable pieces of information but they really aren't patient focused type indicators that you need to watch for and they will creep into those dashboards if you let them. So basic implementation framework, um, that there are steps to achieving uh, uh, a successful implementation. I can tell you 
having worked with uh, uh, two very large examples in this country implementing um, performance dashboards in multi-facility environments, you won't get it right the first time. Despite all the planning, despite all the work of implementing a dashboard, rarely will the first out-of-the-gate data be meaningful, um, and you will find yourself reinventing the process of collection and presentation of information several times. Um, and you need to believe that that first, second, even third presentation of your performance scorecards, uh, it's going to be an evolution of quality of presentation of numbers. So how can infection prevention and control help? Okay. First, it is understanding the role that environmental services plays in com and helping to communicate that message to thought leaders and decision makers in your organization that environmental services does play an important role, that they need to be viewed in a different light than being a back of the house corporate support or cost overhead that somebody in finance can try to squeeze down and manage. Uh, you need to help communicate that message of alignment um, and encourage repositioning of environmental services as a clinically enabling service. It is not a clinical service, but it enables an environment that allows clinical work to happen and happen well. So we really need to promote that. I talked about the notion of trying to think about environmental services increasingly in two dimensions, the clinical environment and the non-clinical environment. And helping to require that your environmental services implement some sort of quality monitoring. If they're not doing it, as many of you indicated is the case, ask for it, require it. Expect presentation of outcomes at your infection control committee. And as I mentioned earlier, helping your environmental services leadership interpret appropriate clinical indicators for your facility. Some things to watch for uh, when you start to get into this whole area of environmental cleaning. Um, Pass-fail type audit scoring. Um, across the country, I keep running into situations where there's this whole notion of people who pass or fail um, with these audits. And there's sort of a whole language coming up around this whole notion of, did I fail an audit? Did I fail uh, something? And we need to sort of get away from that language of pass-fail. Solutions based, not based in real Canadian world. Um, there's a lot of marketing hype coming out of particularly south of the border these days, trying to connect um, the environment, environmental cleaning to patient safety. You need to look at the source of that marketing hype and you need to look at the source of those claims and make sure it is grounded in real Canadian context. So every time I see a CDC quote or a cost per patient day statistic for outbreaks that when you dig a little bit and scratch the surface it's a U.S. number, uh, you need to put a lot of that just on the sidelines and say, you know, we need, it's really not acceptable to talk using data that isn't representative of, of Canada. Uh, poor quality data um, and making sure that the, the clinical data presented is reliable. In other words, environmental services, if they are drawing correlations to clinical data, it should be the same clinical data that is being presented officially within the institution. And so if somebody is presenting something, question the source of that internally, making sure it's coming from reliable places. Be ob observant for qualified cleaning scores. In other words, um, have they somehow interpreted or massaged the, the data that they are presenting in any sort of environmental monitoring program. Uh, lack of employee engagement. Uh, this is one that frequently is a challenge for environmental services to respond to, that monitoring programs and performance outcome scorecards are created, presented with almost no engagement of the frontline employees. And this is of deep concern. And you need to make sure and, and watch for this and challenge your environmental services leaders that they are presenting information, but it actually is engaging the, the employees that do the work as part of the journey and that those employees are receiving the feedback and helping be made, helped understand what to do with that information. 
and transparency of process and findings. Um, particularly today, we have a number of provinces which are starting to publish their environmental performance scores in, uh, in, the, in the media. And I would suggest that that interest in continuing that will sweep across the country. The minute, of course, you present any data in the public realm, there has to be an audit trail to it. And that, that data, the source of the data, the methodology of statistical analysis has to be bulletproof. And how can infection prevention and control help? By avoiding the following. Taking over administration of the scorecard. Okay. Uh, performing quality monitoring for environmental services. Um, playing the role of dirt cop. How many of you played the role of dirt cop? Absolutely, many of you have. Play, playing the role of responsibility judge. Okay. Who cleans what? Okay. The blood and body fluid spill, when it happens on the patient unit, on the bedside rail, it's so-and-so's. When it happens in the lobby, it's gone into the black hole of whose job it is. Right? The computer keyboards, etc. So we've all been there. Compensating for the limitations of environmental services. If you're not getting what you need from environmental services, you know, the best way that you can help is to bring that up through the organizational's management structure and demand accountability. Okay. Dictating cleaning practice and doing all the thinking. Okay. In other words, challenge your environmental services to come to the table knowing their job and knowing their business and demand nothing less. So, next question. In my facility, environmental services is pulled in multiple competing directions. For example, cost versus time, cost versus quality. Okay, we're all in. Wow, so 91% of you said yes. And that is the reality today. Uh, most environmental services leaders that I've met across the country, and I've met hundreds, all want to do the right thing, all want to do a good job. Rarely do people come to work wanting to do the wrong thing. But they are being pulled in multiple directions. Uh, demands from the clinical world about adherence to protocols and best practices, increasing pressures from the organization, the admitting departments, emergency departments for throughput, so speed, and of course from the finance department who is challenging the organization to deliver cost and savings and, and contribute to some financial crisis of the day. And they are being pulled in that and so they need your support, they need your um, influence in the organization to help reposition their value equation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cleaning monitoring. Okay, in my facility, infection prevention and control has or had input into designing the environmental services cleanliness monitoring program and receives regular outcome reports. Okay, so the vast majority of you said no. Okay. You absolutely should have input into designing the environmental monitoring program, and you absolutely should be receiving regular reports of that outcome. And if you're not getting it, you should be asking hard questions up the food chain. Why not? All right. Interesting. Okay. And, okay, so what does good look like? Some of this has been covered by other presenters, so I'm going to stay away from it, and some of it I know will be covered this afternoon in some additional presentations. But obviously we know today um, that we really need to think about environmental monitoring in three dimensions, 
the dirt we can see, the dirt we can't see. So the use of ATB um, or some sort of uh, UV luminescent agent or marking environmental marking to, uh, product, and there are, as we heard earlier, there are a number of them on the market today, different attributes of each, um, as well as cleaning process evaluations where we can speak to uh, understanding how the work happens. Um, we also need to ensure that there's a weighting emphasis uh, skewed to direct patient contact surfaces and to clinical environments. And so we know from, um, from research that has been done that the proximity to the, the point at which care is administered makes a difference to the risk continuum. And it's critically important that environmental monitoring programs reflect that in their weighting and scoring methodology. Okay. Um, and as I talked about avoiding pass-fail mentality, um, be really careful in this whole area of numbers. Um, increasingly today I get challenged by people, uh, a number of the companies today presenting ATP products in the industry are trying to make us believe that some magical number coming out of ATP devices means something. So if your ATP scores are coming out at a 30, is that good? Um, well, it depends if before they were at 40. Um, I guess it is relatively good. But there is no clinical research available today in a compelling way to suggest that a set number coming out of ATP devices is somehow implicit on an impact on HAI rates or the transmission of organisms. And marketing arms of many companies who sell these devices would like to present a different story to you and have you draw a conclusion that somehow a set number coming out of these devices will tell you something different. So you need to understand uh, that whether it is ATP devices or whether it is indeed regular cleanliness audits, unto themselves a number doesn't mean anything yet. It just means the implicit monitoring, trending information will suggest improvement, but uh, the final score is not the big deal. Um, looking for active employee participation at the hourly level, um, and that audit frequencies are comprehensive and aligned to the nuances of each facility. So there's no question you need to have a statistically relevant sample size of your audit process. So someone telling you that they're giving you cleaning scores based on two inspections, um, be really worried. Okay. And it happens. It happens a lot. I've seen it myself. Uh, in, in different institutions. And then, of course, the good old common sense piece that comes with it. Next question. Uh, situation. Your environmental services leader informs the you. Oops, I can't do that yet. <laughs> Sorry, folks. We're going to back up here a minute. Sorry. Your environmental services leader informs you that your quality scores for patient rooms are at 85. Should you be concerned? Ah. All right, everybody locked in? I feel like uh, Patch Sajak or Vanna White here. Oh, okay. So, how do we take, make sense of this? Uh, most of you said it depends, which is absolutely true. Okay. That the um, understanding that the scoring methodology itself only matters when you can put some context to it. And uh, so I get alarmed when I see this sort of uh, pass-fail mentality based on some subjective number, um, sometimes written into a performance standard. Okay. The other area that I think it's important to understand uh, is just a little bit about culture. Uh, environmental services is very much made up of basic dimensions, protocols, people, practice, and product. Protocols, of course, represent the resources and the training that we do. Protocols are the standards, the procedures, the guidelines. The processes is, are how we organize work and the way that we organize procedures. Uh, the product are the equipment, supplies, chemicals, and accessories that are presented to us as tools to use and the performance monitoring is, and troubleshooting is the performance dimension. 
But the reality is um, that uh, these things all need to be in place. Next question. Situation. The scores from ATP glow germ audits on a patient bedside rails are not good. Your environmental services supervisor dismisses the results because requests for bed replacement have been denied for years. Should you be concerned? Oh, this has never happened, right? All right. 61 of you said yes, 10 of you said it depends, 2 of you said no. Okay. The reality what we're trying to suggest here is what you don't want is interpretation of quality scores. In other words, justification. Okay. Because whether it's a bed that hasn't been replaced for budget reasons, whether there is an acceptable quality score on it or, or a condition on that surface or not, um, is a truism that has to be reported. Um, increase, you know, across the country, I've, I've had environmental services supervisors say things like, well, you know, the dirt won't come off. So that means we can ex score it satisfactory. Okay. Or we really need to paint over the dirt. Okay. All these qualifiers that come up. Okay. I tried to get it off and I don't have any more time to get it off, so that's it. It's okay. Okay. And you really need to promote uh, the message that um, you need to stick to truisms about uh, uh, objective findings um, of, of information and that nothing can be qualified. I mentioned earlier uh, that the five P's of environmental for, uh, services and uh, uh, performance excellence hit a cultural barrier. And so the cultural barrier that typically presents itself, ooh, See what's happening here. All right. Some of the common barriers and pitfalls. Okay. Audit frequencies are not defined and are not sustainable with the resources on hand. It takes real work to do these audits. And I know you don't have the time. Um, but making sure that they set themselves up for success in environmental services with the resources to do it. No scoring mechanism or algorithms that are too complex. I have seen some dandies over the years where it would take a degree in statistical analy analytics to interpret the results. At the same time, the need to have a matrix of scoring which is reflective of the risk stratification that we talked about earlier is critical. Standards that do not distinguish between clinical or non-clinical environments. Um, adequate audit training. What does good look like? still comes down to a basic interpretation of some written descriptive sentences or understanding of what clean is, looks like and an interpretation of that and a judgment at the point of assessment that has to be entered onto a device or a sheet or of some sort. Thank you. And hourly employee resistance. So when we get into a hostility situation, sometimes there's union conflict. That's a signal that maybe the information hasn't been presented in the proper context to the employees. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I really want to encourage you to think that environment, performance dashboards are an effective demonstration of environmental services performance against organizational pro priorities and that infection control plays an important supporting role to environmental services to help them realize value and make a difference. Thank you very much. So I'd invite any questions. Okay. Um, I don't really have a, a question mark. I really have a comment. One of, the, um, one of the things that you talked about, or your list of things that ICPs should do to help their teams in environmental services, and I, I have a suggestion for another item. Um, are, if your environmental service teams are really excellent and they're doing great work, they need to go outside the building, they need to engage with other people, they need to attend education and really see how excellent they are. And uh, I encourage my, my, the group in my organization to do that. And, I, <laughs> and, I, and they were kind of ignoring me, so I sent it to their VP and said, this is an education session that's coming. It's all about 
um, getting out there and marketing what you do. Um, and so the director came and said, well, why did you send us to that? And I said, because I need other people to see how excellent you are and the work that you're doing, and I need you to see how excellent you are. And you won't see that until you go outside the building and hear what everybody else is doing. So just I, a I couldn't agree more, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sitar said that ATP wasn't uh, recommended for uh, use with quads. Yes. Uh, when is it recommended for what disinfectant? Well, uh, I won't qualify Dr. Sitara's statements for him, but you know there, there are, of course, a variety of other um, products on the market today. So if we have you know particular products that are showing a, an, a, a the, where the outcomes can be influenced by a particular chemical, um, I don't know that that is true on, in all cases. So. Um, you know, I'll leave it to S Dr. Sitar to answer whether or not there is indeed other types or categories of chemicals where that same effect is in place. I don't know of any, but I, I will leave it for him to answer. You know, I will say again, you know, ATP monitoring is something I would go into. Uh, I, I do agree with it. I do support it with some reservation and qualification that the use the scores and use the findings for good, not evil. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm just wondering if there's been any work done in establishing maybe um, um, the staffing levels that should be achieved for uh, housekeeping services depending on the type of facility it is and the degree of uh, environmental contamination. Right. Uh, there is no work at a standards level that I'm aware of anywhere in the country going on. I would absolutely agree it is very necessary. We need to get out of the subjective emotional debates that tend to go on about environmental services staffing. There is a correlation between the facility size, the nature of clinical activity, the volume of clinical activity, um, the scope of service, all of those pieces come together in a dynamic which quantifies the workload. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately today it requires um, experienced assessment of those variables to come up with appropriate. That often you know, is a hard sell when you're talking to the finance department of an organization um, and it is very much an area of study that the industry needs. Yes, and I understand that a lot of housekeeping manners are challenged trying to do jobs with insufficient staffing levels, and it's yeah, just absolutely. very difficult. Um, Mark, great presentation. Just a couple comments on ATP, and I think um, what we what we're trying to do is using it as a monitor is a, is a, a great tool um, in around the different disinfectants. Things we have to remember is 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 when we're looking at the readings and where we have reactions between different disinfectants, ATP is not meant to be, is product A better than product B? If you're using it at your facility where you're having consistent results, you can create your own baseline, then perhaps it's being sold where you shouldn't have a reading over 250 and you're consistently getting 400. But if that's the baseline, then you can kind of take out any artifacts that way. And I think that's really how facilities need to bring it in um, if they're going to use it from a monitoring perspective as opposed to trying to use it as this, this tool to try to compare which product is killing better because it, it's really just trying to test how clean the surface is. Yeah, thank you. Mark, I congratulate you on a really excellent talk and, and bringing some rigor to this issue, which uh, unfortunately becomes uh, murky at times. I would just uh, remind everyone of a, an important study that's ongoing, if you haven't heard of it, and that's the CHESS study, the Canadian Hospital Environmental Services Study. It's a collaboration between the Canadian Association of Environmental Management um, and uh, my research group at Queen's University. It's really two surveys that were sent in a reminder in paper form to your head office, your CEO, for environmental service to do part A and for infection control to do part B. Many of you have filled it and I thank you and the information is along the lines of what, where Mark has uh, assisted us with this and uh, it's also um, in progress. We're wanting to get as much feedback as possible. I want to get a hundred percent response rate. So help me out. Uh, we, are, we are poster number 26 as well where you can see where we are so far but I think it supports Mark's uh, 
you know, vision of, of the, the, the rigor that we want to bring to environmental services. Yep. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zobman. I absolutely support and concur if you have received the surveys in your facilities. One of the best ways that you can support the strategic and future direction is, as Dr. Zoutman has, has commented. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mark. Great presentation, and thank you. Just to uh, follow on to your comment about ICP, environmental service integration, one of the things I've been asking, Chica, over the last little while, and I hope there are other members here who will join me, is in the creation of an EVS interest group. Because I think it's, uh, there's nothing, there's no standing group or working group right now. I think the demand exists when I look at the ch uh, kinds of questions that are circulated amongst TPIC, my local chapter in Toronto, a lot of them focus on environmental services. So it, it's an area of discipline. I think we can, we can do a lot and bridge that gap even further. So anybody wants to have a talk with me about it? By all means. I would absolutely support that and concur 100%. And I did little, go a little further to say, you know, as you look at your institutions, you know, increasingly you should be wondering why is your environmental services leader not here? Okay. They need to learn this. They need to learn your world. Just a, a quick comment. I just wanted to remind people of the PIDAC document on environmental services, and it actually has an extremely good tool in the appendix for helping you work through staffing levels based on the acuity of the environment in which you're putting those housekeeping staff. So it's a starting point, and I think it's a very valuable tool, and the document itself is excellent. So if you want to get a document that's going to help you, the PIDAC environmental services one is a great one, and it's free. It's um, also being uh, updated as we speak. Um, I'm not sure the exact timeline. My understanding was that the revisions are coming out um, this fall, the last I'd heard. I don't know if anyone can comment on that, but uh, that's just what I'd heard in the industry. So um, if there are no more questions, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.